Happy New Year, everybody. Okay, hopefully everyone can see the screen. And I know there's a lot of football going on, but we wanted to spend 30 to 35 minutes talking about five of the predictions that we have for 2023 and specifically how they impact some of the SAS metrics. So, Ben, you ready for this? Yeah, let's go. Okay. So, first one, everybody can see my screen, hopefully. So, some of these aren't the biggest predictions. It's like, oh, yeah, no kidding. It's more about how does it impact how we're going to measure some of the performance and efficiency. But, Ben, my number one prediction for 2023 is there's going to be a significant increased focus on expanding the AR we have with our existing customers. Going to be hard to refute that one, don't you think? Yeah, hard to hard to counter that one. Obviously, the f focus on the the health of our existing customer base, and we know through the metrics and the data that expanding existing customers is much more efficient than gaining new customers. But we're going to talk now for the next three or four minutes a little bit about some of the expansion efficiency metrics that we believe that what well, we know less than about 25 percent of companies are capturing these today that's going to be really important and one is really trying to understand how much sales marketing and if you're using customer success to try to identify upsell and cross -sell opportunities how efficiently are we getting each incremental dollar of expansion arr and it's called the expansion cat ratio ben and I'm just wondering, with your clients and all the CFOs you kind of work with and talk to, what percentage of B2B SaaS companies are actually calculating, capturing their expansion CAC ratio? I'd say, you know, it just depends on the stage. You know, how many products early stage? Maybe you just have one product and you're focused on getting new customers. So expansion really isn't that focus. So I think, but more mature SaaS, if you're above 10 million ARR, then for sure, you should be looking at blended plus new versus expansion. Uh, you know, so I think early stage, maybe not as much, but later on, definitely that'll be a focus. And one of the questions I get all the time, and I wish I had a great answer, is like, wow, we have a hard time really capturing what percentage of our sales and marketing expenses are going towards the pursuit of existing customer growth versus new customer acquisition. Any best practices or recommendations you have there? Yeah, you know, it can be hard and I love objective measures for this. And really, once you're big enough and, and have a sales team that has reps focused on new business, a, a sales team with a reps focused on expansion, I use that ratio and then split my sales expense that way. And then on the marketing side, that's much more ambiguous. Usually I have to talk to my marketing leader, where are you spending your time, spending your money, your focus? And usually that's a little bit more subjective to get that split. Uh, commonly what I see when I look at these splits is maybe 80, 20, 80% 80 new, 70, 30. So somewhere in that range, 60 to 80% allocation over to, to new business. Yeah. Now, one of the other recommendations we give as company scale is if you're not able to really look at unit of work and allocate those expenses kind of um, more accurately and more granularly, look at the pipeline you're developing on a monthly or quarterly basis and make sure you're segmenting that between net, you know, new customer acquisition and existing customer expansion pipeline. And let's say if you 30% of the pipeline you're creating is from existing customer upsell cross sales, just use that 3070 split as another kind of easy proxy to do it. What do you think of that? I think I think you can. You just have to be careful because say you're horrible at new business and your pipeline has very little new pipeline in there, and then you're doing the allocation that way, you're not gonna allocate as much when maybe you have tons of resources dedicated towards new business. So that's just one caveat with that, is you just have to be careful with that pipeline split. And we have a question here, Ben, um, and I love it when people are asking benchmark questions because we spend a lot of time capturing benchmarks. So what's a good CAC expansion benchmark for the marginal ARR? Well, we call that the expansion CAC ratio, where you're comparing the amount of dollars you're spending to that expansion um, CAC. In 2022, the latest benchmarks we collected from 878 private SaaS companies was 61 cents. So a company was spending at median 61 cents of sales and marketing and expense to $1 of incremental um expansion ARR. 
And that, by the way, contrasted to around $1.55 of sales and marketing expense being allocated to the pursuit of $1 of new customer ARR. So you can see it, it's much more efficient. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so what's the next one? Ben, this is one that I'm shocked that more people aren't capturing. And that is the customer re retention cost ratio. And it's really not a SaaS metric you hear a lot of the VCs talking about, but as companies scale, they kind of do want to know how efficiently you're retaining each dollar of subscription ARR. And that's taking the entire customer success and account management expenses that are specifically allocated to re renewing existing subscriptions and dividing that by the renewal ARR. So, Ben, what do you think about that one? This is one I love but I see almost no one capturing. Yeah, it's not a common metric, I'd say, in practice. You know, customer success is really clear, but, you know, account management, right, they are focused maybe on that renewal plus expansion. So I think that's why maybe it gets confusing because, right, for me, if you renew dollar for dollar, that's not a booking, right? There's no expansion. Uh, you know, we got the renewal that affects our renewal rate, but no expansion, no cost of expansion there. So I think that's why this can can be a little bit more confusing, maybe a little bit more advanced if we're later stage and have very focused focused roles on this metric. Yeah. One of the things I see is companies, often it's Series B to Series C, they really want to double down on customer success because their gross revenue retention, maybe it's at 84 and they want it to be at 87. I see sometimes they're increasing the cost of customer success so quickly and there was real no benchmark of what's that providing a return for, especially if they don't have upsell, cross-sell. It's another yeah. reason why I like to use the customer retention cost ratio. And then there's one other, and most companies start tracking this at 5 to 10 million ARR, and that's what percentage of my total new slash growth ARR is coming from expansion. And one of the things I wanted to show here before we talk about this increased use of product usages. These are the benchmarks from last year, Ben. These are about mm -hmm. six months old now, mm -hmm. and we'll be launching our 2023 benchmarking research in February. But at median, if you look at total growth revenue between new and expansion, 30% came from existing customer expansion and 70% from new. But what was interesting is you saw some cohorts, especially that 50 million to 100 million, which was about 150. 20 companies, I think, their expansion revenue was 43% at median of growth. So any commentary on what you're seeing here, Ben? No, that seems, you know, from my experience, kind of in that that same range. You know? Yeah, I think it's it's good, right? Especially now planning purposes for 2023. You know, you have to know what's coming from new and expansion, you know, so you can lock in those targets for to, for this year. And a lot of the LinkedIn commentary I'm seeing is focused more on retention, expansion, retention, expansion. But it's just, I don't know if there's a lot of empirical evidence of how efficiently companies typically do that. And I'm going to just stop, finish off for prediction number one. Because expansion revenue is inherently viewed as a more cost-effective growth um, channel, there's going to be a lot of discussions, modeling, et cetera, a product-led growth to try to reduce the friction of new customer acquisition and usage-based pricing to get them hooked and then charge them more as they use their product. So we're going to talk about that. It's prediction number five, Ben, but are you seeing many of your clients kind of at least starting to think more about how do I implement a PLG or usage-based pricing model? I think, you know, it, it it depends on their existing process, pro, uh, product, how it's gated their sales team. So now it's like, I think almost like, hey, are we PLG or sales led or which one should we be? Uh, you know, so I think, you know, they're they're trying to figure it out, uh, you know, as they scale. And we're going to talk about some of the metrics that get impacted with either of those kind of newer go to market motions. We'll talk about that with for uh, prediction number five. OK, next one is. Yeah, everybody is talking about, oh, we got to focus more on net revenue retention, also known as debt, net dollar retention. So the first thing, and Ben and I are founding members of the SaaS Metric Standards Board, which, by the way, is going to be officially launched tomorrow. 
But one of the things that we found was a real inconsistency of the way people were calculating net revenue retention. So the first thing we're recommending to companies is make sure you really have it well-defined. How are you calculating your net dollar retention? Are you using the cohort formula or, or cohort method or the formula model? And ben, wondered if you had any kind of unique insights on why the cohort model is superior to the formula method. I like to look at both. I mean, right with cohorts, the whole thing is each cohort, is it improving with each cohort, right? You know, and that's, that's the power of the cohort. And then, you know, how, how does that cohort uh, track over time versus previous cohorts? So a lot of good data in there. I would say this is a, a little bit more advanced from, you know, a, a data perspective, you know, not really to understand, uh, but usually I, I like to look at both, you know, total revenue retention and then on a cohort basis. And one of the things that we found, and I couldn't believe, I even found this in one public company's um, 10Q, is do not exclude your true customers in your NRR calculation, right? In fact, one of these really big companies said, oh, the way we calculate NRR is we look at our current customers today, this accounting period, and we see which of those were customers 12 months ago, and that's how we calculate net revenue retention, which inherently excluded anybody who churned over those last 12 months. So very important not to include churn. Do you agree with that, Ben? Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, what I found with it, sometimes, you know, depending on how your data set up, we have trouble calculating GDR, but NRR is a little bit harder. So those layers of MRR are so important to track and you know exactly what's going into those formulas. Yeah. And then the other thing we've seen, especially in usage-based pricing models, is what's the definition of when new ARR ends and when does expansion ARR begin? And there really is no right or wrong answer. It's just trying to be consistent, right? If you've got a product-led growth or usage-based pricing model, you should be able to analyze, okay, typically it takes X months, maybe it's three months or six months for companies to be fully deployed and at some type of stable run rate. And then you can start calculating what's truly growth versus just a ramp up period. So. Um, ben, I know this is something Todd Gardner, who's done a lot of research on this, actually discussed at SAS Metrics Palooza, a really good article about don't confuse your ramping growth of revenue to growth phase. Any additional insights on that? Yeah, that question comes up a lot in my metrics course, and I think it's it's really got to be internally defined. You know, revenue retention, total revenue retention really doesn't lie because when the customer starts, it starts, right? Then you have expansion. But yeah, if you're looking at from a bookings perspective, uh, I think, yeah, you really have to, it's, it's an internally defined uh, metric and just make sure everyone knows how you're doing it. Perfect. Okay. And then we talked a little bit about, you know, segment by segment calculations. When Now, some people use cohort and segments interchangeably. What I mean here by segment by segment is if you're selling to both the mid-market customers and enterprise customers, or you're selling in the U.S., in Europe, in Asia, really understand what your net revenue retention is for each customer segment, because you may find, ah, oh, the mid-market customers are giving me 112% NRR, where my, my enterprise is only 105. And I know that logically that doesn't make sense, but if you're not calculating it segment by segment, you really don't know which customers that you're investing money to acquire are most profitable long-term as measured by customer lifetime value. Ben, do, a lot, do people in your metrics course ever talk about this? Yeah, it comes up yeah. a lot. I mean, first, you've got to get to the overall metrics, right? And then what is, how do you manage your business? How should you segment your business, right? Enterprise versus SMB, geography, acquisition channel. So always the basics, the fundamentals first. And then how do we manage our business for me, which then dictates how we segment our data and our metrics. You know, Kay actually wrote here, Ben, my experience with the cohort method is that it doesn't work as well when you have high variability in deal counts and deal sizes. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. have any, I don't have a good commentary on it. What yeah, I agree. Yeah, when I, when I target mid-market enterprise, sometimes you may only acquire one or two customers a month and right. That's not a huge cohort and provides really not much value to the company. Maybe then you have to look at the core, a quarterly cohort, not a monthly. Uh, but I agree if it's low volume, 
cohorts just not as powerful because the sample size isn't there. By the way, I need to go back. Kay asked another question when I said the expansion CAC ratio was 61 cents. I want to make sure that I didn't confuse that with the retention cost ratio. What does it cost to retain a dollar of ARR? And that's around 13 cents from a median. Mm -hmm. So 13 cents to retain, 61 cents to have $1 of expansion ARR. Okay, let's move to prediction number three here. Oh, by the way, this was before I moved to expand number three. This is just the benchmarks last year. 878 private SaaS companies for median net revenue retention. It was actually 105% across the entire population. And you can see how that um, differentiated based upon the actual average annual contract size because ACV had a higher correlation to NRR than what company size does. Okay, Ben, number three. Rule of 40 retains in its popularity. I'm not even, before I even build the rest of these, have you seen, even with some of the earlier stage companies you work with, a renewed focus on Rule of 40? Is it still more of a, a more mature company metric? I think it's still mature, but I calculate it for all my clients, you know, early stage or later stage. And maybe we don't focus on it too much, but also, I think it is a red flag if you're early stage and it's highly negative, right? Then what's the story? You know, high cash burn, you know, where's the revenue growth? So often I use it as a red flag indicator if not, you're not mature yet. If it's a highly negative rule of 40, then we, there, there could be a problem. And by the way, this first bullet point, just so everyone knows, this is based upon public companies, not private companies. But if you looked at how important the rule of 40 is to enterprise value to the next 12 month revenue multiples. It's tripled in the last 12 months. And I'm going to show you that benchmark in just a minute. Next, growth rates continue to be important. So a lot of people say, well, cost at all or growth at all costs may be out of style, but growth is not out of style. And what do I mean by that? First of all, most VCs and private equity companies want to see balanced rule 40, not over-indexing on growth or over-indexing on profitability. As an example, um, we just did some public company um, analysis. If you have a 30% growth and 10% free cash flow to get to your rule 40 versus 50% growth and a negative 10% free cash flow, you're going to see almost a 3x difference in the enterprise value of revenue multiple for the balance, the first one versus the second one. So it shows that the market is valuing balanced growth more. Ben, anything you want to add to that? Right, you have to be, yeah, you have to be careful now. So if you can self-sustain, that's even better. You've got time, right? You can have time to let things play out. Uh, but if you're still burning cash, then yeah, you need a plan to figure out, you know, how long it's going to last and how you can uh, get beyond that. People ask me this all the time. First of all, they say free cash flow. How exactly should we calculate that? But so I find about 50% of companies are um, calculating rule 40 are using EBITDA as a proxy for free cash flow. Don't know if you have any strong opinion on which way you would recommend our listening audience to calculate it. it you know, just in my experience, it seems like in private SaaS, not public, that EBITDA is the common uh, input for this instead of free cash flow. Yeah. And the other thing we've seen, if you're not a real capital intensive kind of delivery infrastructure, so you don't have a lot of amortization, et cetera, it makes more sense to use EBITDA than free cash flow also. Okay, rule 40, this is interesting. Now this was from the middle of 2022. So Q2 going into Q3. So the rule 40, high standard deviation at all sizes of companies. But I was shocked last year, Ben, and by the way, it may have been about 40, I think 45 to 46 percent of our population was less than 5 million. So you're going to have a higher rule of 40 often because your growth rates, you know, 80, 90, 100 percent. And we only eliminated those um, that were greater than two standard deviations from the, the mean. But 42 percent was the norm last year for private SaaS companies. Now, I don't know if it's going to get much better than 42% next year, what do you see? Do you have a prediction for rural 40 is going to, where it's going to be? 
Uh, I don't think it'll get easier, you know, because if you're more mature, right, it's hard. It's hard to scrape away and get that that rule of 40, you know, and in and, and early stage, right, yeah, if you're smaller, you, you know, I don't want to say easier, but if you have smaller numbers, revenue growth is is kind of easier. And I'm not saying easy, but it's just easy to push that revenue number higher to have a nice rule of 40. It does, to me, yet not much meaning, but if you're above 10 million and rule of 40, you know, that's a lot, that's, I think, a harder achievement. And one of the things we saw, we're not going to cover it tonight. As soon as companies hit between about 10 and 20 million, we saw their growth efficiency go down. They had to hire more salespeople, invest more in marketing. A lot of times they were entering into a near adjacent market segment. Maybe they were going from mid market to enterprise or from US to Europe, and they didn't have that repeatability. So that's the other thing I tell our listening audience is if you're kind of in that 10 to 20 million and still trying to find growth, be hyper vigilant on your CAC efficiency metrics. Okay, prediction number four, new metrics, at least new metrics in vogue, Ben, all around cash, cash runway, cash burn, um, cash forecasting. And the burn multiple, which, you know, I think it was Crown Ventures popularized a few years ago, is becoming very important to series B and beyond investors today. And that is looking at your net burn, and that's really your, your revenue versus operating expenses, and dividing that by your net new ARR. And I'm not sure if you have your companies calculating the burn multiple now, Ben? You know, it's, it's for some of my clients I am because their board requested it. You know, I'm finding it's a highly volatile number. You know, so for me, it's it's one data point out of the entire metrics framework that I calculate for my clients. So I have to see what everything is saying together versus really, you know, just relying on this burn multiple number. Yeah, a couple of the other kind of capital efficiency metrics we see out there is, you know, it was called the hype ratio. I think Bessemer may have called it hype ratio a few years ago, but just taking your total capital raised and divide that by ARR, and I'm going to show some benchmarks in just a minute. And then there's the um, the other Bessemer thing, they call it cash conversion score. And the only difference with that is you take your ARR and you divide it by total capital raise minus cash. So if you have significant cash reserves from a large raise, a recent large raise, it's more important to see how much you've actually mm -hmm. burnt versus how much cash you've raised. And then the last thing is, I was talking to VCs 18 months ago saying, you know, we're okay with an 18 month kind of cash runway because it was really focused more on growth. I'm now hearing kind of 36 months is the median cash runway that VC backed companies are being asked to try to forecast to for 2023. Any input there? I, I see in the literature 18 to 24, I mean, 30 to 36 months is just like any long-term forecast. It could come out that way or it could be completely wrong. So I think I think that's a little bit of an over-rotation to 30 to 36 uh, because, you know, long-term forecast, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big guess. Yeah. The other thing, um, a gentleman who's the founder of Place Technology, his name's Brendan Metcalf, said, one of the things that he does is he actually looks at what's my total cash consume per dollar of pipeline. And this is cash consume to build pipeline. Then he also looks at cash consume to add $1 of ARR. So it's not an expense, it's a cash, because that way he goes, I can forecast out one, two, four quarters out of how much cash I am gonna to expect to burn based upon my pipeline and ARR um, close goals. Very interesting. Okay, so what are, you talked about being highly um, variable. This is from Andreessen Horowitz. This is about nine months old, but they're looking at the burn multiple based upon size of company. And what you saw here was in the earlier stage, they expected to see a higher burn, 1.6X was a median. And then as company scale, they kind of hit that magical 1X one at, one at 25 million to about 50 million. And then above 50 million, 75 and above, it was 0.7 to 0.5. And then there's the Bessemer cash conversion score benchmarks. And here they kind of do it in their good, better, best. And with cash conversion score, which once again, just um, subtracts out the cash you have on hands from the ratio, 
they were saying best was about 1x. So you would burn about $1 um, of cash to generate $1 of ARR. And, um, and then, of course, they did an internal rate of return, which is an investor perspective, not a operator perspective. Ben, anything you want to add to this? No, I think it's interesting. I think there's definitely some street cred that comes with cash conversion score, you know, that you can build it if you can build a big AR company uh, with, with minimal capital. What was really interesting for them is they they looked at the conversion from your cash conversion score to the internal rate of return as an investor. Mm -hmm. It tells you why they like higher cash conversion scores. Yeah, those are big numbers. Okay. This is the final recommend or prediction. And that is, you know, we did a survey last year and we found about 52% of companies had some usage-based pricing. But once we dug into that, we're going to show you that it really wasn't usage-based. It was user-based. But there's going to be a lot of companies looking at well, if I can reduce the upfront subscription in 2023 and have more variable revenue as they start to engage and use the product. So a lot of people are looking at that. They also know that inherently, if I have a usage-based pricing and my customers are eating the dog food more, you're going to have a higher NRR. And that's goodness since more people are focused on NRR. What a lot of organizations who've never done product, I'm sorry, usage-based pricing don't understand is how resource intensive a lot of the capabilities to effectively scale this is. One is just how do I capture the product usage information into my subscription billing software? But I don't know if you've worked with any companies who have went from that subscription base to usage base and realized they didn't they had a manual process and it couldn't scale. Yeah, I mean I had to bill in arrears and it wasn't fun, right? Because yeah, you know, you have to have clean data, you have to have timely data, you have to have the billing systems in place. So it's this whole other architecture on usage base to have that in place versus just sending out, you know, that one invoice per year. You know, so you just have to be ready for that. You have to be invested, have the right tech if you're if that's really part of your growth strategy. Part of it also is people think, well, it's I get that 20, 30, 40% organic growth if it's usage based, but whoever manages that account, whether it's your customer success person or your account manager, sure he need to have insight into what those usage trends are. Because the worst thing you can do is not let a customer know your economic sponsor. By the way, your usage is went up 30% month over month. You know, going into this month, it looks like it's going to go up another 35% because they may not have budgeted for that level of expense cost. They like the low cost up front, Ben, but they weren't ready for the incremental variable costs. Yeah, and just, you know, from a SaaS founder perspective, it's, you know, just I think make sure you have tiers. You know, if you're going to have usage base, make sure you have tiers because I still think contracted ARR is still the king of valuations. And if you have usage base that can go down to zero, it's just not going to be as highly valued and it's going to be harder to manage your cash flow. So I'm a big fan of having some sort of minimums, tiers, platforms, pricing, you know, if you're going to have this type of uh, pricing model. And that's another reason why if you if you're capturing that usage information in real time and being able to share that with your customer success or account management team, they can proactively go out and say, boy, your usage is up about 30 percent more than what we projected at the beginning of the year. Let's go ahead and get you some unit economic benefit. Let's lock you in for another two years at a 10 percent reduction per unit cost. Yeah. And when I was using Concur, they were great at that. You were in one tier, they're like, okay, you're up in this higher tier, you're paying higher, I can lock you in at that tier. And yeah, they were they were great with that. You know, so it was a great, I thought a great pricing model they had. Okay, next thing. What, excuse me, existing metrics get impacted by usage rate pricing or if you, what new metrics do you new, need? One is net expansion rate. And net expansion rate just looks at the actual expansion revenue year over year, maybe it's month over month, of your existing customers. So if you take gross dollar retention and add your gross net expansion rate, you actually get NRR, right, Ben? Mm -hmm. Yep. So make sure you know what your net expansion rate is on a cohort by cohort basis. Net revenue retention. This goes back to when does your new ARR end? And when does expansion ARR begin? And then your CAC, CAC payback period and CAC ratios, they all can be really dr dramatically impacted 
with when do you um, count your new ARR against your sales and marketing expense to acquire a new customer? If you're only saying, okay, I'm going to start counting expansion revenue at month three, your CAC can go up dramatically, Ben. So have you seen companies kind of get tracked into, I've got higher CAC because I'm going to usage-based pricing? I've seen, yeah, I work with a lot of different pricing models now with my clients and, and with use of any variable revenue, if, if you have material variable revenue, and I've got some posts on this on my blog, you have to adjust these metrics, right? CAC payback period. It can't just be the contracted ARR. You've got to look at that variable component. Same thing with LTV. So you have to modify these calculations or, you know, if you have a lot of variable revenue, these metrics are going to look horrible if you're just throwing subscription revenue into these metrics. Okay, now, $64,000 question. A lot of people, and when I say a lot, almost 74% of B2B SaaS companies are looking at usage-based revenue as ARR, as recurring revenue. What say you? I'd say if you have contracted minimums, yes. If it can go down to zero, then for me, that's not, that's not ARR. So I think it's very important. I think, Ben, when you talk on your metrics course about putting in that chart of accounts and general mm -hmm. ledger, you recommend having subscription revenue and then variable usage revenue as a separate line item, correct? Absolutely. In your revenue general ledger definition, you have to have clear and distinct revenue streams. Even if you roll it up together, people are going to ask about that. You know, so I like to have subscription revenue separate from my variable revenue streams, from services, from managed services and other. Okay. Now, we did do some research, Ben um, and I, with Maxio last year, about 460 companies, and we asked them, you know, kind of what's your adoption of usage-based pricing? So this was um, how many people were using still user-based subscription versus um, usage-based subscription, and you can see we're only 18% only of companies who said they were usage based were just doing it with a subscription. So a minimum and you get a thousand units and you pay me a thousand dollars a month. However, companies who are doing hybrid. So they have a user plus usage was actually 19%. I found that very interesting, but only 4% Ben were saying, I'm just doing usage only with no minimum subscription. Yeah. And then, oh, I'm sorry. Good. Any, any comments no. on that? No, I think that that's a small portion, which is good. If you're usage only and no minimum, I think that's a little bit scary. And out of those 460, as I mentioned, 52% said they already have at least one usage-based pricing variable in use. And another 12% plan to introduce a usage-based variable in 2023. And then here's what I found really interesting. How many usage variables do they have in their pricing model? And I thought it'd be like 50, 60, maybe 7% would have one Ben, mm -hmm. but 30, only 36% they had one usage variable and actually 31% had two different usage variables and another 12 had three. So what this means to me is if you're doing two or more usage variables, it's gonna be very difficult if you haven't instrumented the product usage information into an automated billing software. Yeah, not only tracking, but also just for your customer to understand. If you have five different variables, six, seven, it's just going to get confusing. And then the last data point from that research was how are companies who just implemented capturing their product usage information that then goes into the billing software? 50% are just taking their app, so the business app they're selling, right? And that became the platform that's actually captured the usage information, which often is very rigid, not very flexible. And 17% were using a product analytics platform, and only 9% were using their subscription billing platform to actually see how companies are using the software. So my perspective here is if you're thinking about usage-based pricing next year, you really need to look at how flexible the usage data capture is in your existing platform and try to externalize that from your core app. Anything yeah, else on that, Ben? Yeah, I'm seeing more with my clients, more and more in-house development, or at least through their own application, tracking all this variable data. And if that's a focus, 
versus just a, a kind of a second thought. You know, I'm kind of okay with that. Uh, but yeah, I'm seeing more house, in-house programs in app, in their actual app, track that data. I'm actually seeing some companies now allocate dedicated development resources to the actual capture of the product usage and making sure that could easily be ingested into the billing platform. So they're not taking away time from the core engineers doing feature function releases. Yep. Because often it can be so resource intensive, you lose feature function speed and velocity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so all these predictions, what's your next step? Well, I say, how does it impact revenue multiples? Another variable you should look at. So I'm gonna go through this quickly, Ben. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. but. These are six of the top SaaS metrics that are being captured and how do they correlate to enterprise value to next 12 month multiples in the public market because public market, uh, private markets actually lag what's going on in public. And I'm just gonna do this really quick, but look at in the last year and a half, revenue growth has only went from a 0.37 R squared down to 0.31. So not a significant decrease. So even though we say growth is much less important, it's not that less important based upon how it impacts enterprise value. AR growth, yeah, it's down a little bit, but still kind of high. But CAC payback period has went down almost 40%. But Ben, mm -hmm. I'm gonna skip net dollar retention for just a minute and explain why that's down so much. Rule of 40, balanced growth. It went from an R squared of 0.15, and R squared can only be you know, zero to one, to 0.44. So it's three times more important to enterprise value today than it was 18 months ago, quite frankly, than one year ago. And it's number one by far. And gross margin, which a year and a half ago had no impact on enterprise value, now gross margin actually has the fourth highest impact on enterprise value. So I wanted to see if you had any commentary on what's impacting enterprise value for B2B SaaS companies today. Yeah, when I see this with rule of 40 and, and gross margin, it really comes back to fundamental financial management. You know, rule of 40 is about financial discipline trade-offs. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not surprised. I've said, you know, financial discipline for me as a CFO never goes out of style, right? So I think it's funny that the rule of 40 is back in style. We all should, we should be looking at this all the time. We should be looking at our gross margin profile, our margins by revenue stream, and back to the fundamentals. Now, this is why focusing on a single metric can be so dangerous. Look at net dollar retention rate. Mm -hmm. A year ago, it was the second highest factor on enterprise value to revenue multiples. It's now down all the way to 0 0.07. So I tried to do some additional analysis on Ben on this and why. It's because some of the highest flyers with 50 and 60x revenue multiples like Snowflake and Twilio and Datadog have had the biggest corrections with their stock price down 60 to 80%. So it inherently biased the research because since they had the highest NDRs, they show the biggest decrease in a correlation. So I'm not, this does not say NDR is not important. It just says, that the high flyers really bias this number. Okay. With that, I'd like to leave on the last thing. And that is, you know, our audience is primarily financial leaders. So Ben and I, along with another partner, the FP&A guy, Paul Barnhorst, have said, well, if we want to try to be more efficient in how we're measuring and managing some of our financial operations, things like how we managing subscriptions, how we managing the metrics to make decisions quicker. And quite frankly, even if you're a 10 or $20 million company, you probably have anywhere from 30 to 50 different SaaS platforms that you're using in your organization. So we went out and curated what we thought was top five of the top solution providers in each of these categories. And in a no pressure kind of hassle-free way, you as a financial leader can go see a, about a 30 minute solution overview where they're going to demo the product and talk about one or two customer success stories at this event. So it would mean the world to us if you would go ahead and um, look for the SaaS Solutions Showcase. It's right here on the RevOps website. You can see the URL right here. I'm going to put it in chat for you. But we think it might be a very interesting way for you 
to see some of the top solution providers and not have to deal with a pesky salesperson. Ben, anything else you want to say about that? Uh, I think this will be great. You know, as a CFO, shop for software, it takes so much time talking to sales reps, getting those demos, the PowerPoints, the intros, and this will be right to the point. These vendors are going to demo their solution. I think, what, 30 minutes to demo 15 Q&A or something like that. So if you are shopping, looking for software this year, it's it's. I really say it's a, it's a can't miss event. And I think it will actually improve your process and improve your selection process and make it faster. And for everyone who's ever joined us for Monday Night Metrics, they're going to receive an invitation tomorrow. So I'd ask you guys to go ahead and look at all the great vendors we have. Uh, we had a lot of solution providers who wanted to be at this showcase. And for a series of reasons, we've decided to leave it to five per category. And if you register and you can't attend the live event, it's always going to be available on demand for you. So we'd really encourage you to come and, quite frankly, provide us feedback to see if you think it's a great new channel for you to evaluate and analyze whether a particular software um, solution provider fits your business needs. And with that, Ben, that's another Monday Night Metrics. We thank everyone for coming here before the Rose Bowl ended and before Monday Night Football starts. And you've got our contact information here. And anything mm -hmm. else you want to leave the audience with, Ben? No, thanks for joining us today. This was I love this discussion, Ray. So this was great. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, everyone. Happy New Year. Have a great 2023.